Uh, I know a lot of you have met me, you heard me talk, you've seen me, but you might not have met my, my lovely, lovely co-founders uh, who are way, way smarter than me. Uh, I happen to just uh, be sort of the marketing guy in, in, in this setup, but uh, we wanted to give you a chance to meet all of us, uh, hear a little bit about our background history, how Tracy got founded, and also some of the challenges we had on the journey. So, Miguel Giert and Penile, please come to the stage. Thank you, Chris. So I'm Penelope Hebebron. I'm here to moderate this founders panel where we are going to look into what uh, design thinking thoughts these three guys has betwe have between uh, founding TradeShift back uh, in 2010 and then until now, what has brought uh, TradeShift to where we are and also how do you intend to collaborate and keep on that connection with customers and partner even in the future. And uh, how are you guys feeling? Are you good? Okay, great. So I know it's a little uh, over time and that we are ready for lunch, but I hope you guys will enjoy this session too, because I've been really looking forward to digging into what has uh, informed you guys in the last uh, nine, ten years building this awesome company. And when I ask you guys how you feel, I actually would like to ask you the question, does it matter to you how they feel? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> So, Penilla, you have tough questions. Um, I, I think I was just, I'll, I'll just be very open here. I was just talking to Copenhagen Airport. And we have some issues in Copenhagen Airport. There's one of our customers. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I've heard about these issues. And I hadn't only heard those issues from, from inside our organization. Uh, but I actually heard them from my sister. And my sister, she works from a consultancy implement who happens to also be working with Copenhagen Airport. And, you know... But she told me, like, it's a really personal feeling. Like, uh, I hate when our customers, if there's an issue or if there's something that, you know, between the vision and where we are and we want to be. So for me, I mean, I mean it, it, it can keep me up at night. And, uh, you know, I think they went over and we, we, we just chatted. And I'm sorry if I'm throwing you guys under the bus wherever you are in the room. But, <laughs> but uh, and I know they told our guy after, uh, Kim, who's, who's, who's the contact, they said, wow, Kristen knows about the issues we're having. And it's like... Actually, this stuff that keeps me up. So, so, uh, and so it matters. We, we launched, and I'll stop my rant here, we launched this very big thing we call Custom Obsession Inside Trade Shift. And I've been spearheading it personally. And uh, what have we done is we've taken all of our major accounts, like all of our key accounts that are strategic to us, and we've taken the whole leadership group. It doesn't matter if you do engineering or, or marketing or whatever, you're getting assigned a number of accounts and they're yours and you've got to meet with them, you've got to talk with them, we're going to get the exposure inside the conversation. So yes, it's, it's deeply personal. Yeah. And the reason why I asked that question, of course, is that you're a tech company, but uh, then we are dealing with people who have to change, people who have to do things differently because of the products you provide and, and that you would like people to implement and do differently. So, so feelings in a technology company, it might not be um, a, a stupid question to ask. How do you, you guys uh, resonate with that question? I think it's a very good question. And... Uh, I spent a few years uh, working together with this guy in, in China and we worked with setting up different teams and hiring engineers in, in China and I noticed there was some uh, a kind of generational shifts between some of the people we hired in China and it was definitely so that, that the younger generation you saw they were u very used to working with technology they heard all the stories they've seen companies built by five ten people you know just race in and, and kind of started tinkering with the fundamentals of how economy in a whole vertical works. So all of these people, they had this feeling, you know, with my hands, with a uh, box of Legos that I have, I can actually build something that, you know, that changes the way society works, the way I work with my people and co-workers. So I, so I think there's this uh, ingrained uh, kind of uh, disgruntledness to some extent with the engineers, like, Bruh. If it doesn't work, we'll fix it ourselves and we'll do it our own way. Uh, and I think that's really about the adaptability and something about if it doesn't work, uh, it, it needs to be fixed, I, I, even if I have to do it myself. So mm -hmm. I actually think there's a very strong vibe in many technology companies that if something is broken, we need to address it immediately. Mm -hmm. And actually a lot of the... You know, now, now we, you know, we talked about uh, designing for, for, for change and adaptability and focusing on the outcome. I think a lot, actually a lot of that is very ingrained also in the engineering movement, that, um, that you find ways of working 
that enables you to make that change without being super dependent on other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Geert. It's, it's all about the relationships. And now that you mentioned China, relationships between individuals and in a business setting is really important. So when we came to China and started talking about sort of capturing the relationships in business on a platform, on, on something that had some of the similarities with social media, it immediately resonated with the people in, in China because, yes, business is all about relationships. I will only do business with someone I can trust. And if you can capture that on a platform so I can see my good friends' business relationships, that's something that matters. And um, so, yeah. So this is apparently something that resonates with you, uh, with three of you. So when we uh, build TradeShift, and now we are a lot of uh, employees, how do you ensure that everybody has that mindset? Is that even possible? So... Uh, I think one of the hardest things, right? So um, this time last year, we were around 450 employees in TradeShift. Right now, we have 1,200 employees in TradeShift. Um, we're hiring around 800 people right now. If you know great people in professional services, engineers or designers, please send them our way. Um, but when you grow at that rate, you cannot rely on command and control to sort of implement the DNA, the knowledge, all of these things. You've got to rely on culture. Uh, and, and you're saying, I mean, in Silicon Valley, the saying is that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, you can have all of the strategy you want in the world, you can have all of the plans you want in the world, but if your culture cannot do it, uh, it, it doesn't matter. So one of the things we recently have done is um, we figured out we had so many offices suddenly, and we had so many people working remote and distributed and elsewhere. And then if you're joining and you're recently joining and everybody else is also new, it can get hard to get a feel of what's going on and what's happening in all of these other places. Uh, so we build an app, we, we call it The Way. Uh, it's, it, refer, it refers to our culture, which is, a, we have a book called The Trace of Way, which is our culture code. And we have this app, and it's actually built like an internal version of, of Instagram or a medium. So uh, people around different offices, different places in Trace if they'll talk about what they're doing. They can, you know, share pictures from the holiday party. They can talk about a customer meeting they just met. I know some of you customers, you've had meetings with, for instance, some of our designers. We've done small videos, talked about a function, and we put it on this platform because we realize our culture is sort of becoming a social network more than it's a physical place or an office. So I think we're trying to, to sort of break down some of those barriers and make it much more organic. So when you join TradeShift, it's not really about where you are in the world what office or what department, but it's about joining this network. Um, and, and I think that's one of the big changes we're driving. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, our VP of engineering, Rolf, he has this saying about pain-driven development, which has been one of his principles, which is actually about putting people in, in, in close contact with the issues and kind of, if I, if I write some code and it has some issues, I need to be able to feel the pain of actually fixing that if it impacts a customer or something like that. And I think that's one of the kind of classical growth pains that everyone or most people tend to get a little bit further away from, from the customers and from each other internally. It's like this expanding donut thing and all the chocolate chips. I'll not go further with that metaphor. Uh, but, but I think that's really something important in that. And, and actually, we worked uh, pretty consciously about trying to turn that around like we we experience that kind of pain. So when you talk about customer obsession, I think that's actually a stage where we are now, where we actually want to invite uh, our customers a little bit, get them a little bit closer to us. Also in the journey of when we are conceptualizing uh, products, uh, our roadmaps and so on, to get that understanding. Uh, I'm heading up uh, Church of Frontiers, which is our digital innovation arm. And deliberately, we kind of decided to set ourselves up in a structure where we almost see my outside of trade shift we, we have to build stuff on top of the platform as if we were third parties to the companies. And that means if we are to be successful in creating anything, we need to start having those kind of dialogues about ideas in financial services, ideas in physical supply chains, with maybe other stakeholders than we normally uh, speak to in your companies, like the um, uh, people who drive digital innovation or digital change agendas, um, who drive uh, transparency in supply chains and so on. So I think for us, it's a new phase about strengthening the, that kind of outreach. So it's actually a matter of building in pain into the system so you can feel it yourself, what your customers are feeling too, in order to react to those? Or, or how Do you do that deliberately? Or what's your thoughts on that? 
I yeah. think we've we've been through a number of iterations of of pain in trade shift. Uh, you you grow to a certain point where the existing structures they they break and you need to rebuild them. Actually, in the very early days, we had these. Uh, Uh, team camps where we would meet up, we would simulate maybe three to six months of uh, the future of, of trade shift, and then we would break the existing teams, rebuild them, and as part of breaking things up, people got out of their comfort zone, but then quickly they got used to resetting with a new team, and, and, and now we need, we need uh, ways to grow our organization. I'm setting up our fourth office in China, We need to make sure that our culture in that office uh, is based on the same values as we have in any other office in, in TradeShift. I think mm -hmm. two examples to what you just said, right? So first off, on Gerd's example on, on the wonderfully named paint-driven development. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we recently had uh, our, our workflow queues were starting to get uh, the pretty long with some of the issues, and supporters are dealing with it. So I mean, a supporter would go log in, look at it. And uh, what Rolf did when, when the queues got fairly long was he moved that task from support to the engineers who built the workflow software, right? So suddenly the people building the workflow software, they have to go and reset the issue and solve the issue for the customer. And guess what? Like our workflow issues, they just dropped very, very quickly, right? And I think uh, to, to, to your point um, about setting up and breaking, I think we used to call it just-in-time bureaucracy. Um, the, the idea that you sit down 12 months before and try to think what bureaucracy you need to manage something new that's happening, um, you, there's a big chance you're going to over-engineer it, right? There's a big chance you're going to create too much steps. So we prefer to get close to the problem, really understand what it is, and then very quickly try to implement a solution. And of course, sometimes that gap can be a little uncomfortable, but it also means we don't over-engineer and we're using our resources in a very efficient way towards where the problems are really emerging. Right? So the experience you get building your own company, it, do you use that experience actually in your collaboration with customers and partners? I mean, we, we turned most of our customers to work agile with us, which, which when we started, we thought was going to be incredibly difficult because IT departments really like waterfall and they really like three-year plans. and. We really like to be able to sort of realign with our customers continuously on what are their goals. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, and, and today it's, it's a lot more accepted, right? But that was one good example, at least. Yeah. And I think yeah. now we're, we're seeing partners building on the back of TradeShift using our platform to build their own companies. And they're going through the same growing pains. But they also have the, the benefit of being able to ride with us out in the world. For instance, to, to China, where we have a partner that has now been building up 13 consumer channels in a business-to-business-to-consumer way of, of selling into China. So, so we can be a vehicle for others to go through this journey, and, and hopefully they can learn some lessons from, from us. So back uh, in 2010, had you imagined that this was uh, the path you would go on? Um, what, what was uh, in front of you when you actually found a trade shift back then? What was it that you saw of needs in the market that uh, inspired you to actually embark on this journey? Um, I th we've been working together for, for five or six years before. So I think, first off, we already had a connection. We knew each other very well. We've been trying to do really big stuff uh, from inside the government. I think there's a... There's an old uh, Leonard Cohen song about uh, trying to change the system from within and being sentenced to 20 years of boredom. Uh, it wasn't boring, but it was definitely difficult, and there was a lot of red tape, but we did manage to, to build a lot of infrastructure for the European Union, for global standardization, for trade. But I just think we felt like, wow, we can just move so much faster if we don't have all of these shackles. And, and I, I mean, from the very first vision that we set up, which was we want to, hey, What can we do that's bigger than the European Union? And, and I mean, there's really only one answer, is the world. Like, what if we could connect all companies in the world? Uh, and I think whenever me and Mikkel have presented ideas like that for Geert, he has always looked at us and said, you're fairly insane. Um, but this time he just said, okay, sure. Um, <laughs> which I think is, is probably, I don't know if that's a, that's a good health check, I'm to check for you, but <laughs> you, you get boiled slowly enough, you, you finally get there. But I don't know, yeah, from, from my side, it felt like we actually stayed very true to that vision, but of course, the tactics in this change a lot. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Uh, what, what, we, what we set out to do is, is pretty much where we are today, um, and so... It, it's not very different. The original vision we had for TradeShift 
and, and what we saw we could do is, yeah. yeah. I, I, th I think we set out on a, on a kind of big, uh, big idea. I feel we are halfway. Uh, and I'm sure maybe also some people in the room do feel that. I mean, I, one of the fundamentals of the space we are moving into is like the diversity, the incredible diversity of supply chains, because it's like every single vertical, it's every size of company, it's every market in the world, um, and and it covers, it, it touches on every process inside of a company. So of course you can't be very good at that. And I still remember something in our first experiences when we started speaking to enterprise customers and like, so you're going to digitize our AP process, you are these 25 odd people from Denmark, what's your experience, how does your you know, uh, list of features compare to competition? And of course there was no uh, comparison, but there was a belief in, in a way to do it differently. Uh, so I think that carries a lot of weight, but it also means that in the big picture, I think there's so much more to do. Uh, I think we're at a stage where we can't do that ourselves, but we have to do it through strong partnerships with the customers, with partners, and so on, utilizing the platform. I, I, so I think, uh, and, and, and back to your question, maybe, uh, I don't think we had that in mind when we started. We, we knew about the diversity, we knew we were creating a platform, but we're also a little bit like software as a service, uh, viral networks, we're going to get there in three years. Mm -hmm. but, but I also yeah. think, um, yeah, we always thought, oh yeah, it would take three years and we're done. Um, <laughs> some of our board members probably have feelings about that, but um, 10 years later and we're getting there, right? But I, th I think one of the things that, that we encounter again and again and again is we're solving problems that really haven't been solved at all before, right? And I, I'll give you an example, right? If somebody said to me, uh, they joined our professional service organization and said, oh yeah, I've worked in SaaS a long time. I know how to get a customer live. I said, well, that's great. The problem is you're not getting a customer live. Every single customer is putting 10,000 to 100,000 customers live. The customer plus the whole supply chain. Because it's not just a blind, stupid portal you type something into. Every single person in that supply chain are getting a full SaaS application with a set of applications they can use. Um, so we just need to figure out how to do on onboarding of 10,000 companies at a time per sale at a cost that's competitive in a market, right? And, and that's when the, the person who's like, wow, that's, that's a little bit different than anything ever done before. So, so often we have to go say, whoa, nobody know how this has been done. We gotta go find some solutions, but I think we also, depending on your viewpoint, either insane or optimistic enough that so far we found the solutions, right? Uh, but it is a lot of challenges that, that are unknown or haven't been done before. When Mikkel started out in China, and he could probably talk more about it, everybody told us there's no way you can penetrate the Chinese market. It's not possible for China, for Western companies. Uh, nobody had been able to get a license to operate there. Uh, it's extremely complicated, all of these things. And we went in sort of with a, a mix of, I would say, optimism and naivety and, and somehow got there. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, through through so a lot of pain, Christian, and yeah, so. Uh, Mikkel I didn't have gray hair then. <laughs> No, uh, yeah, building trade shift, expanding, uh, any company expanding across the world, setting up uh, a business unit uh, in a new place, it's, it's, it's a lot of pain, it's uh, getting to know the market, it's finding your local partners and, and building those relationships, and uh, it takes a lot of uh, tenacity to, uh, to do that. And, uh, yeah. So founding a trade shift in Denmark, what in the society or in the surrounding communities here in inspired you and influenced you in the way you have managed to build up the company? And what else are you inspired by? That's a good one. Um, I think there's a certain anti-authoritarian streak in Denmark, like you, you're not very nice to your teachers. And uh, there were some revolutions going on in the 60s and 70s in the educational system that meant like more power to the students. And I think there's something around that, like uh, keep asking really annoying questions that I think is common to many people that I've met in Denmark and that tends to infuriate also people outside of the Copenhagen office when we got more and more international. Mm -hmm. Which, which I think That's has, has part some of the Danish some, DNA. Some <laughs> and you guys being <laughs> annoying, the, the, the low power Keep being distance, annoying. right? You know, <laughs> yeah, any, anyone in this company can walk up to Christian and, and challenge him um, on, on anything without wait, getting uh, her head ripped off. Um, wait, way too many people do. Mostly, <laughs> no. I think like there is in Denmark a very low power distance, right? It's a very equal society, and I think 
that we baked into our company culture. And I remember the first time I did a town hall in the US and we brought over a bunch of, of trade shift employees from Denmark to work in the US with us. And we're doing this town hall and uh, this engineer, he put his hand up and he says, I really don't believe in this part of the strategy. It was in front of every single employee we had in the US. And you could just drop the penny, they were all like, all Americans like, oh my God, this guy's fired. And, you know, but you know in Denmark, you kind of got to engage with that guy. You're going to go like, why or what is it you don't believe? And we had this conversation, right? And so now what we're trying to teach people is it's okay to ask questions. In fact, you got to ask a lot of questions. Not as many as get, less than get, but in general, <laughs> you should ask a lot of questions. Uh, so I think uh, asking questions, low power distance, um, and, you know, also I hope and I think that's something I hear from a lot of our customers, and authenticity in how we deal with our customers, right? We, we try to be real people and not just show up with a very polished sales presentation. We'll do that too also when we need it, but, but be real. And also if there is problems, be very real about those problems and, and solve them. And, you know, I've never seen anything that's visionary not have problems in, in realizing it. Yeah. So do you think that influences your product? That way of working and being yeah. together and collaborating? I, I truly believe so uh, because... Um, these guys will challenge any predefined process. Uh, I remember very, very heated discussions we've had in the past about how business has been done and how it should be built on the trade shift platform. A lengthy discussion whether we at all needed uh, purchase orders on our platform. Do we need purchase orders in business? Is it part of a normal business process? And you know what, what constitutes a purchase order? Why is it that we structure a, a, an invoice or purchase orders with a lot of lines? We're, we live in a dig digital age. Why is it that we just have, don't have just one line per purchase order or per invoice? The, the cost of processing is going to zero. Why is it that we still do things that we did you know, yeah. 100 years ago? I mean, I remember when we launched TradeShift, we launched it without credit notes because we thought they were stupid. Um, <laughs> our customers educated us a little bit on that. So, you know, <laughs> I think it's a dialogue. We gotta, we gotta move. We wanna push, uh, we wanna push innovation, but we obviously also gotta listen, right? But I still agree with you on the purchase orders, by the way. I do think it should just be a stream of transactions, right? And uh, so, so, how, so I, how do you take that, you know, that culture you build up between yourself, where it's okay to actually have a heated discussion and maybe even fight in front of others and stuff, and then engaging with customers and make them feel assured that you're actually doing it to the benefit of them? I think you're going to involve people, you're going to be authentic, you're going to be real, and then I think then they trust you. And, and that trust you, can, you need, because we are going to try to push the needle, right? Uh, if we were just selling what everybody else is doing, I wouldn't need that. I can just go sell the packets and say, here it is. Um, so, so I think... Uh, the moment we lose that authenticity or that trust, we, that's the real problem. And, and I mean, all of us, at, at least, we can still have extremely heated discussions um, for, uh, you know, about purchase orders or credit notes or automation or, you know, what's next in logistics or all of these things. So, so I think we still have it as a big part of our DNA. And I think most of the company, like the transparency inside TradeShift, that's very visible. We're not, we're not going into a meeting room and hiding it and be like, oh, now we're discussing strategy and nobody else can know we're disagreeing. Uh, I think it's fine to disagree. I think at the end of the day, you're just going to commit to the strategy and the direction you set. Mm -hmm. So, you know, dissent all you want, but commit at the end of the day. All right. So, uh, can you give us each a story from, from uh, TradeShift that you think uh, tells something about how this has actually impacted the way you work with customers? With me? Uh, <laughs> I, I think um, one story is um, we, we had a customer very early on um, and um, we've gone through a full sales cycle and, and sometimes customer sales cycles are pretty tough things to go through and in this particular case we were not a very big company, it was our first big North American customer. They had went out and to market and done an RFP to, to get an invoicing solution, an AP automation solution. But we were very well equipped to deliver and you know, we'd bond, done some custom apps for them as well. That was very cool. And then suddenly, the last week of the process, they decided that they also wanted a workflow solution. And rather than just sort of say, okay, we don't have that, we, we pulled out some prototypes and some very early concepts of a workflow solution. We were thinking about like, one that was based on chat and collaboration rather than process and stuff like that. And 
they just loved it. And they said, hey, can you also show this and this? And I was like, literally only like five buttons you could click in that prototype. I said, actually, this is, this is what we have. Um, and they decided to sign with us. Um, and, and we were very open about where we were. Uh, and I remember that we literally then, you know, we thought this is amazing, we won this. And then the day after, the CIO, he called me and he said, just for the record, I think my procurement team is insane and I can't wait to see you fail. And you got three months to deliver this workflow solution, which you never will. Um, so what we did was we took our whole engineering team, the poor workflow team, there's always these guys, we took the whole engineering team that was working in workflow, we flew them over and we put them into a meeting room at the customer's side. And I don't think they saw sunlight for three months. But we delivered it, right? So that was part of that transparency and that culture. And I think for the buying team, for the business side, it actually gave more trust that we were open about where we were and what we wanted to do. And you know, IT, they wanted a finalized solution. But the problem with that is then you can only get what already exists, right? You don't get any innovation. Hmm. So that was my story. All right. Um, well, it, it makes me feel very humbled when um, in the very, very early days, large customers would come to us and trust their business transformation with us. A, a very young company at that time, huge global companies that allowed us to step into their business and help them with the digitization of their supply chains. And later we've seen partners do the same thing. They're basing their entire business on our platform. And that, that, that kind of trust that we see from, from our uh, customers and partners just really, you know, we have to deliver. We have to connect with you guys. We have to solve the problems that we meet out there. And that, that's super important for us to, to just be in this be there. together. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure it's a specific uh, story, but, but with the work that we're doing in Frontiers, we, we take a lot of ideas and very early concepts. We spend a lot of time. Uh, speaking with potential partners, technology partners, commercial partners, go-to-market partners that, that could potentially turn this into reality. And I, I think that has been actually a big lesson for me, that actually when you lay out these things and very openly share your ideas, even at you know, whatever stage it's, it's at, people really tend to open their doors for you. And they tend to get an equal footing and also say, these are our issues we are facing. This is what is challenging for us in our strategy now and share you know, where they are at. So, so I think there's something about that, that transparency that, that also helps uh, leveling the conversation some, somehow and, and stir up these uh, very unexpected and, and very fruitful uh, conversations uh, to way. So that's actually also something I, I hope we can entertain right. much more in the future. Okay, it's great to see that you're all three still here. It's been a journey and it still is. And uh, we wish you all the best also in the years to come together with everybody here. So give them a big hand and see you later. Thank you.